So thus far we've uh, been able to, uh, we've discussed the, how to do a regular one-way ANOVA, and we're going to delve a little bit deeper now into a more specific type of ANOVA called a repeated measures ANOVA. So a little bit of background uh, to repeated measures ANOVA. Um, let's suppose a scenario where you're testing the effects of an over-the-counter over drug on a patient's blood clotting over time. So you gather your participants and you take clotting reading before administering the drug, which is your baseline, and then you take reading uh, readings bi-weekly for the next month while they're taking the drug. So the question is, what is the independent variable? Uh, it's time, uh, as you're giving the same treatment, but you're looking at the effect, at the effects in the same patients over time. So for this design, what you use is what's called a repeated measures ANOVA. And this uh, construct also applies for the following design, where if you gather the subjects to investigate the immediate effect of a series of over-the-counter drugs on uh, blood pressure, for example, um, after each drug is given, the, and after each drug is given, the blood pressure is only measured once. Um, since multiple measurements are taken on the same group, it should be analyzed with repeated measures ANOVA. And uh, just to more graphically represent this, it can measure uh, changes in a score over time, which is what we talked about, like uh, with blood clotting or blood pressure, measuring it with one group at a time, T0, then letting them take the drug and looking at T1, then they continue to take the drug and they, you take the measurements at a time T2. Or it can represent the changes in the score over treatment value, or over, over differences in treatment. So um, one group gets treatment X, and you measure their blood pressure, then the same group gets treatment Y, and the same group gets treatment Z, and you look at differences in blood pressure. And so um, basically repeated measures means that any time where um, measurements are taken on the same subject over and over, you need to use a repeated measures ANOVA. And so just looking at the, the logic of a repeated measures ANOVA, we'll compare it to a one-way ANOVA, and you'll see that it's not actually um, that different. It's just one extra step involved. And so as a bit of a review, um, we found that the sum of squares total and its associated degrees of freedom could be split into uh, within and between values. And that um, for each, uh, for both within and between, you could calculate a mean sum of squares. And then from that, and then use that to calculate an F statistic. And if your F statistic was greater than an F critical value, you would reject your null hypothesis. So similarly, um, uh, repeated measures ANOVA starts out the exact same and actually has the same equations for these three values. But then what it does is it splits the within subject variability into two things known as SS subject or an SSE for uh, sum of squares error. And it's split into these two things to remove uh, subject to subject variability. Uh, it's the idea that we don't care as much about um, differences that occur within subjects versus uh, that persist between subjects, so we actually take that out and account for it. Um, again, we calculate the F statistic by using, uh, here, let me use my pointer, or felt tip, uh, mean square error between subjects, which is just SSB divided by DFB, and then we divide that by mean squared error, which is just SSE divided by DFB. And again, if the F statistic is greater than the F critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. So, like I said before, the SST, SSB, and SSW equations all stay the same, as we've seen them before. And your sum of square subjects is defined as follows. Um, with mathematical notation, it's basically the sum of the squared difference between each subject mean across time or treatment and the grand mean. And then it's multiplied by uh, A, which is the number of different uh, time or treatment measurements that are taken. 
and this has degrees of freedom of n, equal, n of n minus one, uh, n being the number of subjects you have. And since the sum of squares within can be broken up into subject and error variability, we can then get these relationships. And so you don't even need to calculate SSE because you can just find it by subtracting SSB and SS subject from the total sum of squares. And uh, that also follows for the degrees of freedom associated with the error, although it's also the same as just saying n times 1 or n minus 1 times a minus 1. So here's our example. We've got eight subjects and we're looking at the effect of a drug on clotting time, on how long it takes to uh, for a subject's blood to clot over time. So they get a pretreatment a value after two weeks and after four weeks. And so the null hypothesis is that the means at each time, so pretreatment, two weeks and four weeks, will all be the same for the patients. And the alternate is that at least two of the means are statistically significant from one another, assuming a significance of 0 0.05. And so, uh, just to continue, we've added one column over here, which is just the treatment means over time. And so, what that is basically is, this 5.333 is just the means of 8, 7, and 1. And similarly, this value 3 is just the means of 5, 3, and 1. Just so you have a lay of the land. So our grand mean is 5 and a half minutes. And again, remember that the grand mean is the mean of all 24 of these measurements right here. Okay? And I'll leave it to you to calculate that it's five and a half minutes. And the sum of squares uh, subject is A, which in this case is three, because there's pretreatment, two weeks, four weeks, there's three groups. And it's, let me change my color again. Um, and it's times the value of 5.33 minus the grand mean of five and a half square plus 5.33 minus the grand mean of five and a half squared, so on and so forth till you get all the way down to the eighth subject. When you sum all that together, you get a value of 62. And your, um, your degrees of freedom associated with that are number of subjects minus one, eight minus one, which is seven. So, um, uh, from, uh, your, from the previous lecture, you should be able to calculate these values here based upon the equations that were given. But if you, uh, going forward, you can put the sum of squares subject, we've now found it to be 62, with uh, a degrees of freedom of 7. We can find SSE by subtracting. 62 from 111.25, and we get 49.25. And similarly, with the degrees of freedom, we can subtract 7 from 21 and find that that has 14 degrees of freedom. So now we can calculate our S statistic, which is the MSB divided by the MSE. So the numerator is just uh, 82.75 divided by 2. And the denominator is now not 111.25 divided by 21 like it would be in a one-way ANOVA, regular one-way ANOVA, but instead it's the subset with this 49.25 divided by 14. So when you do this you get the F statistic being 11.76. And so it's important to note that removing the subject variability from the error term can reduce, can in some cases uh, reduce the denominator depending on your uh, degrees of freedom and make the S statistic larger and actually more powerful and able to detect even smaller differences than uh, with a regular one-way ANOVA. So let's compare the F statistic we calculate to an F critical value. Um, using an F table we can find that our uh, F critical value is 3.739. Note that the degrees of freedom between are two 
and the degrees of freedom error is instead of using 21 like we would have for one-way ANOVA, we use the subset, which is 14. Okay. Now, starting at 3.739, if we integrated the, and took the area under the curve, to the right of that, we would get alpha. So the space to the right of that is what's called the rejection region. And alpha is 0 0.05 in this case. So our F statistic was calculated at 11.76, which is well within the rejection region. And you should be able to see that if I started integrating at 11.76 and going to infinity, that that associated p-value would be much less than alpha which would suggest that at least one treatment is statistically significant from the others. And so hopefully through, through this example you'll see um, uh, when a repeated measures ANOVA is appropriate to use and uh, hopefully see that it's not actually that much different from uh, one-way ANOVA. Just a couple more calculations and you now uh, will know uh, even one more way of uh, being able to compare uh, sets of data.